And I'll start this up and uh, start it up over here. Uh, with okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, I had mentioned uh, that this event is, uh, is uh, centered around ABMs and hybrid models. And uh, recognizing that people come from a wide variety of backgrounds, I'd like to provide you a hands-on experience up front of an ABM. As it turns out, it's a hybrid ABM. So it will illustrate some additional principles there for those interested in hybrid modeling. Um, and uh, we'll use this to illustrate certain principles um, and concepts uh, relevant at the operational level, at the, um, the level of uh, implementation of a model, uh, at the level of model design, and at the level of, of model scoping and, and purpose. Okay? So um, in order to accomplish this, uh, we're going to go through a couple tasks up front that will take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, the first thing I'd like you to do, and I will do it in parallel with you, but in a different way, reflecting the fact that uh, I'm running a different operating system, is I'd like you to call up any logic. And the TAs stand ready, or at least they sit ready, um, to help you. Um, so uh, within, uh, if you're logged in, um, you should be logged into Windows. And uh, you should be able to go to the start menu in the lower left and uh, choose uh, from that start menu under the programs, you should be able to choose any logic. And I'd like you to call that up. So TAs, please uh, deploy and, uh, and, and scout for anyone who needs a bit of help getting that launched, OK? And I'm going to be doing the same thing. But uh, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain here. Um, I'm going to do it in my own, my own way um, because of the different system I'm running. Okay. Um, so there we go. I'm calling up, calling up any logic. Yeah. So. Uh, the plot thickens, Wade. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, TAs are circulating here. Ladies and gentlemen, when any logic comes up, I'm going to um, close some features of mine so it looks a little bit more similar to yours. Um, but when any logic comes up, what you should see is uh, broadly a screen that looks roughly like this. Roughly like this, okay? And I'm going to be working to orient you towards this interface in more detail later. But um, we're going to be using any logic as a tool to load a model, okay? And in order to get that model, thank you very much. That's great, Shreem. Um, before we can go open a model on this, um, we're going to go download that model. So the first step was to get up any logic. Um, does everyone, have, anyone still need TA help to get any logic up and running? Everyone okay to go forward? Okay. So the next thing I'd like you to do, that's step one. The next thing I'd like you to do, ladies and gentlemen, would be to go in that participant resources um, for the boot camp. You've got example models in any logic eight examples. Okay, um, there's actually a a model here that's called GIS uh, and PA environment version five any logic eight. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, uh, so where do you find that? Well, again, it's under example models. So if you go to that participant resources under example models, and then you have to go kind of through the AnyLogic 8 examples. And if you scroll down, um, you should be able to find GIS. If these aren't sorted, you should be able to click at the top here and sort them by, by their name. Okay. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see this GIS food and PA environment 
Uh, B5, how many lots you get? Version 3 or 4? Uh, it's it's B5. B5. Version 5. Okay. Um, now, uh, if you go into that, if you click on that folder, and I'll, I'll just illustrate it here, if you click on it, you should see something that looks like this, okay? Um, uh, where it actually lists out some information on it, okay? Um, there's actually a, a thing, it's called an ALP file. That's actually the AnyLogic file. And then there's some other information which we won't get into, but it's, it's called the cache. And basically it uses it to just keep around some information so it doesn't have to recompute it. But what we're gonna focus on, and I apologize for going through this a bit of administrivia, but once we get this sorted out, we, we'll be able to use it throughout the bootcamp. This ALP file will need to be downloaded, okay? And uh, the way that we've done this in the past is a little bit ugly, but it's viable, um, uh, which is if you double click on this, it'll come up and look hideously ugly, but there's a button up here which should be in the upper right that will say download, okay? Um, so how did I do that? I was here and I double clicked on that and then I pressed this, whoa, and I pressed this download button up here, okay? This is just to get it down on our computer. It's, it's nothing to do with any logic specifically. It's nothing to do with agent-based modeling specifically. It's just, I'm sharing this with you on Google Drive and you gotta, you gotta do the Google Drive thing. The other way you might be able to do it, depending on your browser, is by right-clicking on this and choosing download. TAs, can you verify that this is working with the built-in browser on these machines? Because it differs a little bit by browser. If you could right-click on this guy here and click uh, download, make sure you can do download here. That would be less ugly. But it changes over different versions of browsers and so on, so, and Google Drive. Okay, it works. So that may be less displeasurable, aesthetically, okay? So you could right-click on it and do download. That's, that's an equally good option, okay? Um, the, the long and short of it is we need to kind of get this file down to our computer, and in Google Drive, it's a little bit of a, of a hassle, but probably right-clicking and doing download is the easiest way then, okay? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, does anyone need a bit more time to get that down? We're, we're, we're through the races, okay? Or, or, or back to the races, okay. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, having downloaded that, you should be able to go back to any logic, um, go, go, go get any logic again and do file open. Okay, and you will want to choose your downloads folder and go grab that ALP file. Okay, this is going to be something we'll be doing a lot during the boot camp, so ask questions now of TAs um, if you're having any trouble. So how did I do that? I went back to any logic. Um, you can even close the browser if you'd like to. Um, file open and I went to downloads and I went and I found that, fold, that file that I downloaded, this ALP file, any logic project file. And I'm going to say okay here, okay? Hopefully I'm okay, you're okay. Um, and uh, by so doing, it will load in um, that particular model, okay? Um, uh, into any logic. So you should see something along uh, along these lines, okay? And uh, uh, this, this is a model which we will uh, now interact with. Um, so uh, I'll give you another minute. Um, I will, uh, meanwhile, just be doing a, a little bit of work to um, 
so that I can uh, show some, something a little bit uh, more quickly in a minute. But um, we're going to be engaging in, um, in use of this model in the next few minutes and we'll be running it in ways that will allow you to explore the ideologic interface but at the same time explore some of the concepts associated with agent-based modeling. And I'm going to, to, uh, to show you some features of this. Okay, so does everyone have that downloaded and opened in any logic? Does anyone need more time? Does anyone need TA help? Is anyone beyond help? Okay, um, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we downloaded this model. I would like to walk you through in broad terms some features of what we're dealing with here, okay? Um, so you'll notice that uh, in downloading the model, um, there's some structure that appears over here on the, uh, on the left-hand side of any logic. Depending on the layout of your particular situation, it may appear in the front <laughs> or, or uh, further, um, or, or rather uh, above or to the right but probably for most of you, it also appears to the left here, okay? Um, and that structure, you'll notice, has a certain um, uh, hierarchical character to it. You, you may recognize some of these, these icons as indicating their stuff at different levels. And, but broadly speaking, what we'll see here is a bunch of blue things and a bunch of red things, okay? Um, the, the red things up top indicate elements of the structure of the model, sort of um, uh, building blocks, as it were, of the model. And you'll notice there's, if you just look at their names, um, they're a little bit interesting. We have a person, uh, but we also have parks, supermarkets, convenience stores, and homes. And then we have something called uh, main, which happens to be the thing that's opened here. So this over here on the left, this is a a hierarchy browser, browsing the model structure. Over here, in, in the so-called canvas, we're looking at one particular component of this. We're, we're looking at main, okay? Um, and, and main depicts sort of a stage on which agents will strut, a stage on which agents will be circulating, and this is an environment, a, a context for agents. If we double click on person, we'll actually see something rather more uh, interesting yet at first glance. Okay, so I double clicked on person and it's gonna use the canvas to show me aspects of personhood. So what we see over here, when you double clicked on person and showing me the details about person, this is sort of the assumptions we make about what personhood means in the model, or what it means to be a person, personness as it were. And you'll notice um, a bunch of things start to show up here. Um, there's up here in the upper right, maybe you can't see it easily, but if I were to zoom in, um, uh, you could see it with, with greater clarity here. You will see a, a little representation that depicts a person in a sort of a weeble-ish way. I don't know, I don't know I'm not sure anyone here is old enough to remember Weebles, except for the person talking to you right now. But uh, Christine has a Weeble-like thing on, the, on her desk. Um, uh, and this is a, uh, a depiction of a person. And actually, this uh, shape, you'll see, actually evolves over time. And it evolves based on a person's weight, OK? You'll see that um, the model has some representation of connections between individuals. But it also has a number of other features here, okay? Um, and I want to briefly highlight these. There's some sort of representation of food procurement in this construct called the state chart. And you'll see something about a person can be not seeking food or can be engaged in seeking out or, or buying things at a supermarket and similarly with a convenience store and going home. And you'll see there's some sort of logic here in a different way of expressing that logic, a different language, as it were, associated with eating meals. Um, 
reasoning about choosing the meals um, that a person will make use of based on what's in their larder uh, versus um, what's, uh, you know, what's available in terms of um, exter external stores. Uh, now, in addition to this, um, uh, to those components, there's some sort of dynamics associated with weight. And for those more familiar with system science traditions, you may recognize this is in a different way of articulating dynamics than either of these. Here we're making use of stocks and flows. Here we're making use of system dynamics or, or compartmental modeling. We're characterizing a person's weight in kilograms as a quantity that's rising or falling in, in a continuous fashion according to energy in and energy out, where energy out is af affected by basal energy expenditure and, and is affected by some factor related to parks. Beyond this, though, there'll be some other features associated with the agent that probably won't be visible immediately, um, but if you go over to the left-hand side here, you'll see they have a home. People are associated with a home. This is called a parameter, this little thing that looks like a slice of pie. Um, they have a home. They have certain preferences with respect, in this case, to their eating habits. And to what degree do they prefer Tim Tams and meat pies and, um, and uh, floaties? Uh, they're in Adelaide, I guess. Um, and, or to what degree do they prefer um, fresh fruits and, and, and vegetables? Um, uh, here on the left-hand side, there's um, variables keeping track of their larder. Uh, how many counts of convenience store meals they have in store or supermarket meals. And then some cumulative measures of how many they've ever eaten. In short, these are aspects of their state. Their current situation is depicted by a combination of their current weight, some aspect of the meals they have um, in store and those they've ever eaten, some aspect of what their situation is with respect to um, the supermarket, et cetera. And we also have a process uh, separately. It's not about their current state, but about their decision-making involving eating meals. And what you'll see here is that we have a kind of theory of personhood here. A person in this model is assumed to be characterized by certain properties, like having a home and preferences, and certain underlying situation, their state, that evolves over time, whether continuously like weight or in some discrete way, like what sort of behavior they're engaged in, and according to certain structured rules, like involving decision making with regards to food. Okay, um, so this is a model which um, where we have a theory of personhood in the form of each agent. There's the potential for connecting agents, and these agents will be placed, moreover, in a context um, that is delineated by main. So main is going to depict the sort of global context in which these agents are placed, their world. Um, and we're going to have agents placed at various locations around a geographically inspired space, um, one that, that uh, depicts uh, a world down under. And you'll actually see some agents already placed on there. These are supermarkets shown in, in uh, larger form here. And there'll be convenience stores and parks are depicted here uh, according to their geographic locations as well in these uh, green dots. So these have a certain geographic specificity to them that have been used to place them in this resource, or in this, in this environment, this context. Um, so if you go look at convenience stores, for example, they'll be represented by this kind of retail outlet, um, little green depiction. Parks have this depiction, which you've already seen, that light green square. Supermarkets have that depiction. And someone's home have this little small house um, depiction. So we have a theory of personhood. We have these other more passive agents like homes, like convenience stores, like supermarkets, parks. And we have this context in which these agents are situated. Now, that, that may pose some, um, some value in and of itself. Articulating a theory in terms of 
a theory of personhood, would take that theory out of my head, put it in a way that others could look at and make comments on, right? By putting this in a fashion that's explicit, that can be shown to others, you might say, well, wait a minute, where is the place in your model for physical activity that's undertaken indoors, uh, not merely at parks? Or where do you take into account differences in basal expenditure rates among people with, with different diets or what have you? And, um, and so you could critique a representation like that. And that's part of the value of modeling is to invite that critique just by showing its depiction of the situation. But modeling goes, um, modeling as a tool for learning, as a tool for more quickly spotting our inconsistencies between our thinking and what's operating in the world, goes beyond, the modeling of the sort we're talking about this week, goes beyond inviting critique on a representation as valuable as that is. Um, it's not to be sniffed at. Showing a representation that's explicit and precise and inviting critique because of it can be very valuable. But by virtue of articulating this representation in a fashion that's precise enough, we can go beyond merely looking at it and critiquing it. We can actually go and run it. We can basically say to the simulation software, go figure, go figure out the, the implied consequences, the logical consequences of this depiction as I've shown it. This theory of personhood and how it interacts with the surrounding environment as depicted by Maine. Um, we can say to the software, look, you know, it's hard for me to think in my head about how all these things interact, about how weight interacts with setting the supermarket to the decisions about eating meals and so on. But a computer can figure out the logical consequences of this far with far greater speed, ease, and precision and, and, and exactness than I can in my head. So taking this theory um, in an articulated fashion, we can operationalize it. We can run this as a going working hypothesis uh, within the software and ask what is the logical consequence over time and over space of making these assumptions. So we can take this theory and we can operationalize it by running it. So to do that, we make use of this blue area of the left-hand side. So this up area where components of, of the sort of theory of the model this bottom elements are components associated with, with scenarios um, by which we enable, we enact, we undertake or we operationalize this top component. So for example, for the baseline here, this is what's called an experiment. I like to refer to it as a scenario. And each of these experiments will be associated with certain particular assumptions like parameters, a population size, a count of homes, and um, whether we take into account physical activity or not. Um, and different scenarios or different experiments, if we click on baseline versus baseline with walk, we'll, we'll notice, okay, Baseline with walks assumes a greater level of physical activity in the sense that this is checked. Physical activity is checked. But the key point is we can run this model with specific different particular assumptions numerically about quantities in the model and about specific um, values of, uh, of assumptions in the model. And by, by putting that into, by enacting the model, we can right click, for example, for baseline, right click on it and select run. This is one of three ways we can run easily in a model. Another way is to do model run and choose which thing you want to run. Another way yet is this button up here. Any logic uh, as normal allows you a couple ways of accomplishing tasks. But I prefer to do it by right clicking on the experiment and choosing run because I find there's less choices involved and it's more straight, more clear about what you're invoking. So when I said run, this screen appeared. And this screen basically allows me to change other assumptions like how quickly the model runs, um, how far to run it into the future. I'm just gonna say run here. 
I'm going to say run, okay? Um, and what we will see is uh, the logical consequences of those assumptions. So you'll note here a physical environment. Some of you may recognize the fair city of Melbourne. Um, and uh, you will recognize there's a set of homes, a set of supermarkets, a set of convenience stores, um, uh, respectively in blue, yellow, and green, that are placed over the surface according to their, uh, with, the, with two of those, the supermarkets, convenience stores, and indeed parks shown in, in bright green squares, they're at their actual physical location. And you see individuals um, uh, placed in that sort of weeblish fashion at certain places um, uh, whose orientation is not always the most salutary. Um, but if you actually slow down, I'm going and, and slowing this down through the interface, you may be lucky enough to see one of these uh, weebles moving around. And if you do so, you'll notice, you may notice they're moving according to the thoroughfares of the city of Melbourne. Um, so they're, they're following established routes according to some logic. And indeed, we can specify whether they should be following footpaths, uh, bicycle routes, um, uh, car routes, uh, etc. But they're moving in this geographic space, and they are engaged in food seeking in this space. So this individual is, for example, um, partaking of the supermarket uh, on a, on a um, semi-regular basis here. Uh, and other individuals are expressing their preferences for, um, uh, for uh, convenience store fares. Now, this is an enactment. This is nothing more than an enactment of this model, of this theory of personhood together with an environment and interaction with these uh, stores. But I want to drill down and give you a sense of where this is coming from. So if we go over here in this AnyLogic panel and we click, there should be a sort of a, a, a little spoked gear here on the right-hand side, um, which if you click on it, will open a panel of some import, okay? Um, and that panel will make available to you a wide variety of other options. Um, these options include pausing the model. That's this, this kind of double, um, uh, double uh, thing there up, up, up front. You could stop it. I'd suggest you not do so quite yet. Um, but you can pause it. You could run forward a certain amount of time, for example, one day. You'll notice the model's inching forward in days here. Time goes on. I've slowed the model down, so it's progressing slowly, but it's progressing hour by hour or minute by minute through the day. You'll notice there's an actual sort of real-time clock here um, that places this back in 2016. Um, uh, but you'll notice there's a set of other controls, which I want to emphasize right now. So beyond zooming in and out, you can also go and select things here. So this top one will allow you to actually select different components of the model. And if you scroll down partway through it, you'll see these various um, references to supermarkets and convenience stores of various sorts. Um, but what I actually want to focus in on is something called population, okay? So um, the population there um, allows you to browse members of the population. So, so TAs, watch out if anyone needs help here because people are engaging with, with any logic. Um, so please, please keep your eye out for anyone who needs, needs assistance. Okay, so um, here we're looking at population members, okay? Um, I've drilled down to members of the population. How did I get here? I went, I, uh, first of all, I went to this thing. To call up this panel, I used this, uh, this little button here, okay? I open it up, and then through this area it says dot, 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 I can go and I can drill down, and I had to scroll down 
Um, these unfortunately are not arranged alphabetically, um, but I chose population. And now what's actually showing me each member of the population, which is a population of people. So here we see an individual whose weight is 93 kilograms. Um, that weight has been evolving over time according to dynamics articulated by, most directly, by this stock and flow model, this, this uh, uh, compartmental model associated with weight. Um, but uh, that model is, ends up being affected by energy intake, which is in turn dependent on what their food, uh, food um, uh, consumption preferences are, which are affected in turn by food seeking behavior uh, according to supermarkets and convenience stores. Um, this individual has this weight over time. At any given time, they're in a certain state with respect to food seeking. And these states will evolve over time. So if I were to run this forward a little bit, I would note that sometimes their weight will be, their weight will be evolving. Right now, it's, it's actually decreasing for a certain period of time. And you would also find, if you were to speed this up a little bit, that they would engage in food seeking behavior on occasion. So if you see this flashing, it's because they are engaged in uh, sorties to go obtain uh, food. Now, their food that they obtain is shaped in turn by their preference for convenience store meals. This is an individual who has an unseemly um, and ultimately adverse um, predilection for consumption of Tim Tams um, and uh, perhaps even of, of meat pies or even Twinkies. Um, so they have a 90% a preference for convenience store meals. And what that will mean if we really dug into it, and we won't have time to do this at the moment, we'd find that that factors into their willingness to trade uh, distance for, um, for convenience uh, with respect to um, uh, seeking out or for, for, for their food preferences. So they're willing to go a longer distance for a convenience store meal compared to a supermarket meal, for example. So they have preferences, and that's going to shape their energy intake. Those Tim Tams, while individually seemingly innocuous, will end up um, leading to deleterious weight patterns that, um, uh, that increase their, their weight uh, uh, beyond its uh, baseline level. Um, and it'll be shaped, uh, it will affect their, their seeking behavior here. So this is one individual in a diverse population. If we go to another individual here, individual one um, is someone who has a slight preference for convenience store meals, but a, 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 a comparatively lower uh, weight associated with it. Person two, uh, or the third person in the population also has that predilection for convenience stores. But if we were to go on, we could find others who are, this is an individual who prefers fresh fruits and vegetables um, and the pleasures of the local, um, uh, the local produce market to the, uh, to the, when compared with the allure of the uh, convenience store products. So here we see individuals' uh, situation shaped by the environment around them, but also by their preferences, shaped by the environment in terms of whether they go for a supermarket or a convenience store under a particular circumstance, um, but also affected, affected by the proximity to a park, as it turns out. Um, uh, and uh, proximity to parks are an aspect of the built environment that end up shaping their evolution um, just as much as the placement of convenience stores and uh, supermarkets. So this is a model, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a model that's it's a, a presentation model, a toy, a demonstration model. It's a model that can be readily critiqued. But the basic features that you see here are ones that carry over to many areas of dynamic modeling. Um, and illustrate some of the features as well of um, hybrid modeling. Here we have a model which knits together a stock and flow representation of weight together with a um, uh, uh, Asia-based uh, depiction of uh, food seeking, for example, and decision making. 
I'd like to highlight, though, an additional feature of this. If we go up to the highest level, if you use this arrow here, and you go up, whoa, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. I want to go back to this, uh, uh, to this um, sort of home there. What you'll notice is if you scroll up something of significance, okay? Um, so uh, if we scroll up using a, by left clicking the mouse and moving around TAs, please help. Um, by, by, uh, so who needs TA help to, to scroll around? TA help is needed, uh, sector two, row two. Okay. Um, so who else needs TA help? for navigating? You'll notice if you uh, scroll around in this model, towards the top, a variety of types of output of the model. Okay? Who else needs TA help? TAs stand ready. Amongst the finest TAs in the world for this sort of guidance formidable in erudition and, and practical skill. Okay, um, so ladies and gentlemen, if you click and you scroll around, um, you will find that up at the top, there's um, a depiction that goes beyond the individual level. We are just browsing things at individual level. Someone's weight trajectory, what state they were in with respect to food seeking. Um, their, the, the size of their larder, their preferences, for example, with respect to um, convenience store food versus supermarket food. But what you see here above the, that, that area, uh, fittingly, is, is a depiction of summary measures across the population. Having simulated an individual level, and an even within the individual, within the skin as to weight dynamics, we can summarize things up at a at a, at a population level. And the population here is extremely small, so at any one time, for example, um, we can depict this in a, in a very, um, uh, very terse way. But here, for example, we see uh, a scatter plot where each person is a dot, hence there's 10 dots uh, shown in this, um, in this slide, including one way out yonder here. Um, so we on the x-axis, uh, so a dot represents a person, and the X location of that person depicts the fraction of their meals that they are securing from the comforting allure of a convenience store, okay? Um, the Y location for a given individual indicates their weight, okay? And you may notice, um, uh, even given the small numbers involved, uh, a certain pattern. Of, of, of relationship between those. This pattern would be more marked if I were to run it with a larger population. So with your leave, I will actually do that. I will go and I will say, um, let's say a medium population. This is gonna be size 100, and I'm going to run it uh, from the start. All I did is I chose a different experiment. I terminated that one through a, a button, you can terminate it through this button or you can terminate it over here. And I'm going to run this out for a little bit. Now we have a population more appropriate for, the, uh, for our interests. And I'll just go display that graph again. And what you'll see is a pattern emerging. As the dynamics of the model evolve, a given person's situation will evolve. So uh, a given person, the population at any one time is again a dot. And over time, that person's status with respect to weight and the fraction of meals they happen to have eaten from convenience stores will evolve. But broadly speaking, we see a certain pattern of significance, right? Um, what this is saying is, it's not necessarily something about, it's not necessarily something that uh, is going to match patterns in the world, but it's something which we might look to, to see how well it matches uh, empirical data from the world. So here we see an association induced by this model, by this dynamic model, running it induces an association. And once you total up all those factors, people's preferences to go to things close to them, and the fact that supermarkets are not distributed quite the same way as, 
as, as convenience stores and the location of parks and people's decision making preferences with respect to particular meals you know, and preferences to build to build to purchase larger amounts at grocery stores. You'll see that once you total all those things up, um, there's an emergent pattern that, that emerges that comes out of the model that is generated by the model that induces an association between uh, on the one hand um, uh, fraction of convenience store meals eaten and on the other hand um, people's weight and it is a sobering uh, association you see that there's an association uh, writ large between um, how much they they eat from convenience stores versus their weight now this is not the only graph we could create from the model, but it is one that we might seek to falsify. We might seek to challenge this graph, right? The model might suggest, okay, given the theory you've articulated in the form of this theory of personhood, um, given the, the sort of connection between food seeking and location and preferences, this is what it implies and we might find comparable empirical data on the world through larger scale cohort studies or what have you that suggests it's a very different relationship. And that would have spotted, help us more quickly spot there's some gap in our thinking, some inconsistency, how we're conceptualizing the world and what the data from the world actually suggests. In short, it, it allows us to test this model in the crucible of empirical evidence and to test our theorizing in the crucible of empirical evidence more effectively. The fact that we can run it, see the induced patterns, and compare those induced patterns to patterns in the world. But one of the virtues of a model like this is we're not limited to one type of output. It's not like a regression model where you know, we might have one dependent variable um, that, that comes out of it. We, we might be interested in fractured meals versus uh, eating at convenience stores versus weight, but maybe we're equally interested in, you know, how does, uh, how does uh, the, the relationship between a person's um, home location, uh, its distances to a grocery store, for example, um, co-vary with their weight in kilograms? Are those who are more distant from grocery stores, for example, do they tend to have higher weight? And here we would find um, a real limitation associated with that association. Or grocery to store to convenience store ratio. How far are they from a convenience store compared to a grocery store? Um, here, as you go out further on the x-axis, they're, they're much further from a grocery store compared to a convenience store. Here, 10 would be you know, 10 times as far from a, a grocery store as a convenience store. On the y-axis, again, we have weight. And so what this is saying is, well, those who are located further from a grocery store tend to be associated with higher levels of weight. This is associational, right? It's, this is an associational output from a generative model, but it is something that allows us to say what associational patterns would we expect if this theory is true about the world in a way that we could then compare with evidence. Um, uh, we'll come back to the point that it's associational and you know further up preference for meals uh, from convenience stores versus weight or park distance versus weight in kilograms. We can do any number you know have any number of different outcome measures and compare them against um, what we might see from the world in ways that we could challenge the model with empirical evidence and thereby challenge our thinking about the world as captured by the model in terms of um, falsifying it. This, now this is important because these patterns are implied by our model. So, you know, our model collectively, the, pat the, the um, assumptions about this model, how it depicts uh, decision making being made about eating meals or going to convenience stores or how weight changes, that's all packed up into this. this. This results from those assumptions, but without a simulation that tells us what, what we expect as behavior from this model in terms of these outputs, 
we wouldn't be able to necessarily falsify it as quickly. Um, it's the very fact that we can say to a simulation package, you know, go tell me the logical implications of this in terms of this relationship that we can get evidence from the model and compare it with evidence from the world and say it just doesn't jive. Or it does jive in this regard, but not that one. Maybe it lines up not on this graph associationally, for example, but maybe it lines up uh, quite well on this one. And so it's this ability to, to use a model as a, 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 as a way of taking our theorizing out of our heads and put in explicit form that's part of the value here. But a lot of the value comes from taking this out of our head, putting it in a form that can be operationalized and saying, what are the logical consequences of this in terms of behavior over time or behavior over space that we could then compare with empirical data and say it doesn't add up in a way we could never have done by just theorizing in our head or by just looking at this model unaided by simulation and saying, does, is this consistent with empirical evidence? I could put this in front of the most quantitative of individuals, such as Wade McDonald here. And I could say, without access to a simulation, does this align with the empirical evidence we have about the relationship between distance from a grocery store and weight, or, or you know, preference for convenience store meals and weight? And Wade could look at this all day, and as bright as he is, he couldn't tell me how consistent it is with that evidence because it's very hard for us as people to total this up in our heads. What is the logical implication of this writ large across the population? But computers are extremely good about doing lots of dumb things quickly. And they can simulate the consequences of this assumption across many people in a situated context and tell us this is the this is the logical implications of that theory in a way that we can then compare with the world. So this is a lot of the goal of of of, of why we do modeling. It's to allow us to think more critically, to allow us to it's not that we necessarily think this is the truth, but by representing this, we can more quickly spot where there's inconsistencies between this and what's observed in the world. We can more quickly spot gaps, oversights, oversimplifications, misspecifications in our thinking than if we were unassisted by simulation and by modeling more generally. So modeling is a social tool for inviting critique, but it's also a tool for more quickly spotting the inconsistencies in our thinking that are latent, that, that are otherwise unrecognized because of our inability unassisted to, to take this theory and compare it with the model uh, uh, you know, in our heads. We need a simulation to tell us the logical consequences of this, to tell us what behavior is generated by this and uh, to, to do so in a fashion that's quick. And so modeling, in short, is a learning tool. It's a learning tool that allows us to, to learn more quickly, more deeply, more robustly, and reliably uh, about the world by more quickly allowing us to spot oversights in our thinking, oversights and inconsistencies in our thinking. Um, and it's not so much the model is wrong, it's a failure of modeling. It's a failure of a model. It's the model is wrong. It's a success of modeling because we've advanced, we've identified a problem in our thinking about the situation that that now we know about that we otherwise wouldn't have known that there was a problem. Okay. So this is a little bit about my perspective on modeling, and this is an example model that allows us to illustrate these principles. And this model illustrates these principles in a fashion that points to the goals of this particular boot camp. Agent-based modeling, depicting a situation in terms of individual agents um, and uh, having agent behavior articulated um, not strictly only in one paradigm, like with state charts as, as they're used in agent-based modeling or purely with stocks and flows, but with a mixture responsive to different needs. Um, 
placing those agents within a broader context, um, here depicted by a geographic context and other times perhaps by, uh, by one or more networks um, of, of linkages, and being able to run that model over time to see the generative behavior and the emergent patterns which are not reducible to any one piece of the model in isolation, but rather results from an interaction of lots of different pieces of the model together um, in a way that's typically nonlinear, that, that can't be reduced to any one piece of the average of pieces, and which depends fundamentally on their interactions in a way that's not additive. And that's what we see in this sort of model. Um, this model can depict uh, individuals in a context, uh, in a context where they have localized perception, they are situated at particular uh, locations, they evolve uh, with different characteristics here, such as their predilection for, um, for convenience store meals compared to grocery store meals, and their evolution is path dependent. It, it, it depends on uh, their current circumstance, how it evolves in the future. Um, they don't evolve all towards one sort of outcome, but rather in ways that depict uh, that is based on their history. Um, uh, these individuals are uh, interacting often in, in models, here less so, uh, though they're interacting with the environment. But they're often placed in environments um, or uh, contexts that are uh, empirically grounded, as, as this one is by GIS. And we see that by so doing, we can use these models as thinking tools, not just at one level, say at the level of individual weight trajectories, um, as we saw earlier in the dynamics of those weight trajectories, but also at the level of the dynamics of the entire population, um, such as, as we've seen here in the patterns associated with that population. So agent-based models, hybrid model, here a, a multi-scale model in sort of a very simplistic form, um, but one that illustrates many of these foundational principles associated with dynamic modeling. Okay, a first glimpse of these, these uh, uh, patterns um, uh, in agent-based and hybrid modeling. Uh, a little bit of modeling philosophy there. A little bit of exposure to the particular tool which we've been using, which while not privileged is a useful one, any logic. Um, and one that I, I hope will provide a point of reference um, for the balance of the day and maybe even the event um, as sort of one type of model that you can you can build here, but the general the general principles articulated models as learning tools, uh, models as giving rise to dynamics that is 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 not capable of being anticipated from any one component, and is not merely an average of multiple components, um, are very important ones. I will note one other thing of great significance that we'll be hitting on. Uh, in the last day of the event, um, but a great significance in contemporary discourse. Um, you saw the patterns there. I'm going to run that same model um, with uh, somewhat different uh, assumptions, okay? I'm going to put in place here an assumption of added physical activity, okay? Um, and I'm going to run this model uh, as quickly as possible. That's this button here. It says runs as, as fast as possible so that we can get to see some of the patterns that are, that are induced. Now, I don't have the, um, the, the graph handy, but you may notice that there's a, uh, a somewhat different set of patterns here um, noted. And, and while I'm undertaking this, I'm actually going to be clicking on this map here, and I am engaged like a city planner's dream in seeding the store, uh, seeding supermarkets for fresh fruits and vegetables in diverse districts of this municipality. What do you think the consequences of this will be of, of putting in place additional supermarkets? Anyone? How, how might it affect some of those graphs we saw above? 
I'm sorry? Yeah, so it will pull down the weight. Now, how much it will pull it down and what pronounced ways, given the fact that still some individuals are going to have to, they're going to have a, a, a hankering for, a preference for Tim Tams that draws them even now to that more distant, you know, siren call of that convenience store over there. Um, uh, but at the same time, we're going to make it easier for them to go to supermarkets. So on balance, it will, you know, they, they may have a supermarket so close they, they can't resist the arugula and the kale, you know. Um, uh, so they'll be, be drawn nonetheless to, uh, to supermarket uh, fare on occasion. Um, uh, but it's going to alter this relationship. And in fact, if you look at this, um, I'm, I'm not showing it here, but we've actually bent the curve. And we've bent the curve in some notable ways. This curve was previously going up in a, in a more narrow way about this, about this um, sort of diagonal axis here. And now it's, it's much more concentrated um, uh, down, down here on the lower side. And you may say, well, wait, we didn't, al we didn't alter people's preferences for stores. How, how could it be they're eating a lot more meals at convenience stores? Well, there are a lot f excuse me, fewer meals at convenience stores. Well, now they don't have to go as far. And so, you know, to make that milk and bread run or to make that quick, uh, you know, purchase, there's a supermarket just down the street compared to that Max market or, or what have you that's, you know, uh, two, uh, three, three blocks away, they'll tend to go to the supermarket um, and, uh, and buy healthier fare. So what we've actually done is bent this curve. And the point here is a very important one philosophically, and it actually relates to my last boot camp for those who are here for, for both. Ladies and gentlemen, when we're dealing with patterns in the world, associational patterns, um, those patterns depend on a certain data generating process. They are contingent upon a certain process that gave rise to them. And um, when we're dealing with uh, patterns we see in the health sphere in the world, those patterns are not rich in the stone. Those patterns result from a certain set of processes operating in the world. And in counterfactual regimes, such as a you know, remarkably high density of supermarkets, um, uh, a change in supermarket density or encouragement of, of uh, walking behavior by availability of, of sidewalks and walking paths or what have you, it changes those associations that are noted. So counterfactual regimes are, are uh, regimes that will often change associations. And, and we see it in this graph. If you were to go back in the video, you'd see it writ large. Uh, uh, you actually see it a little bit in this one as well. Um, uh, this preference for meals for convenience stores versus weight in kilograms has been altered. Uh, this one as well, park distance versus weight in kilograms. Um, the point is that when we examine counterfactuals, they often change associational patterns. And this too is a motivation for use of models. Because traditionally within the health sciences, we've made strong use of techniques and tools whose job is in life to parcel out um, associations into you know, a set of covariates. We, we take apart an association, some outcome measure, and we, we tease it apart into to what degree is that associated with changes in this covariate or that one, and we express it in a regression equation, or, or, or you know, maybe it's a, it's a um, uh, generalized linear model um, of different forms in terms of the link, link function, linkage function, but it's, um, it's parceled, parceling out associations. And what this is pointing out to us is, Associations are fragile, and when we change data generating processes, such as by intervening in a system, we can expect that, logically speaking, it will lead to changes in some of the associations in ways that we won't necessarily be able to anticipate up front. And models of this sort, by depicting, by depicting um, 
posited causal relationships between factors. Posited, I emphasize, because they're not guaranteed to be correct. Indeed, we're trying to falsify them with these models. Um, but by depicting causative relationships, one of the foremost goals of this model is to inform these counterfactual investigations, these investigations of counterfactual regimes, which, whilst they change uh, the associational patterns, the model is able to accommodate because it's not resting on associations. A model of this sort is resting on positive causal mechanisms, the generative pathways spoken about in critical realism, for example. And it can be used to help us understand how associations might be expected to be altered uh, within the sphere. A model of this sort is also not merely parceling out associations in a linear a way that presupposes linear causality or, or other components, um, but I'll go less into that here. This is important in the age of big data. It's important in the age of deep learning and you know, black box models where it's all about prediction in terms of capturing today's associations. Associations captured in empirical data from the world and trying to, trying to capture those, fit those as it were to very flexible curves as delineated by deep learning uh, networks. Those curves, ladies and gentlemen, as rich as they may be, as, as, as uh, rich as that data may be, those curves are contingent. They are, they are contingent upon a data generating process. And if that, in the event of counterfactual regimes such as intervention scenarios, those associations may be profoundly altered in a way that that deep learning method, the, the results of that deep learning method are no longer predictive at all in the new data generating regime. Now, there are plenty of regimes where in the data science sphere this is less of an issue. If we're seeking to predict faces, for example, to be able to predict from someone's face, you know, to what degree they are a certain person or to what degree they're happy or sad, um, we're unlikely to substantively alter the data generating process anytime soon. Um, if we're seeking merely to, uh, to, to understand the degree to which, you know, uh, a picture is indicative of a certain animal, this is less of an issue. But in the public health sphere, when we think about tools like deep learning as an alternative computational tool compared to, to dynamic modeling, two rich alternative tools, this is of central, this is of central importance because uh, dynamic models are designed to inform understanding of counterfactuals. Deep learning models and m many other machine learning techniques are designed to exploit associations but are, are not capable of, of, uh, of translating in their current form into counterfactual regimes. I speak that as a data scientist myself and someone who uses deep learning models. They're each tools for their own areas. What we're seeing here is how profoundly associational measures can be affected by counterfactuals. And that is a big motivation for these dynamic models. Okay, so let's have a break right now. I know that's been a lot. Um, but I hope it's been useful in orienting you. And we're next going to just hammer a little bit more about these motivations and go into the three major types of dynamic modeling traditions in system science, which we'll be seeing during these boot camps. Agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, and discrete map modeling, okay? Um, we'll be uh, doing a brief tour of those in ways that will make us particularly well, particularly well positioned for uh, dealing with uh, hybrid models where we meet them together and by talking about their trade-offs. So thank you very much. Let us uh, partake of the, um, uh, the food and uh, we'll be back here in 10 minutes to, uh, to take this further.